Welcome to Resilient. My name is Mike Kearney, the Risk and Financial Advisory CMO. We're now on our 11th episode in our Confronting the COVID-19 Crisis series. We've only really scratched the surface of the issues that organizations are facing. We are obviously in uncharted territory and the issues that companies face seem to really multiply by the day. That's why this new Resilient series is so important so that we can provide you with actionable guidance to help you respond to the crisis and start to plan for the future. You may have heard our April 4th podcast on the CARES Act, the largest aid package in US history. Today, we are getting an update from our public policy and tax specialists on what phase 3.5 means for current programs, as well as what we might see in future acts where the focus may turn to stimulating the economy with greater emphasis on investments. I'm joined by three Deloitte leaders who continue to stay close to policy matters and their impact. Returning to the podcast are Shahira Knight, co-managing director of our government, public policy, and public affairs group, and John Traub, managing principal of our tax policy group. Joining them both are Kevin Thompson, a managing director in our telecommunications sector, who focuses on telecom strategy. Let's hear what they have to say. We've been doing this new COVID-19 resilient podcast for the last couple months, and I've been starting each interview with a really simple question, and that is, what are you doing to manage well-being? Today, I'm going to mix things up, and in my humble opinion, I've had an opportunity to interview many leaders that I would say are unbelievably resilient, and one thing that I've found is they all have hope about the future. Uh, so mixing it up today, I just want to start with the question that I'm going to ask each of you to answer, and that is, what gives you hope today about the future? John, I'm going to start with you today. Well, thanks. I, I guess I'll, I'll say what makes me hopeful is that we are an amazingly resilient people. Uh, we've been through depression, oil embargoes, uh, financial crises. We've always emerged from it stronger. This is a really, really big challenge, but I think the, the DNA of the American uh, public is such that we will, we will emerge from it okay. Kevin, how about you? Thanks much, Mike. Um, so as, as, as terrible and tragic as, as this global pandemic is, I, I see two aspects to it. First, I, I see so much good coming from so many people to help each other out in a time of need. And, and that really reinforces my faith in the basic goodness of people and, and quite frankly, humanity and, and how we can come together to take care of each other to, to solve tough problems. Uh, you know, we're, we're obviously early in this. We're not on the backside of it yet, but um People, especially our first responders, the healthcare workers and essential workers, have shown, quite frankly, tremendous empathy, grit, and resilience, and and that gives me hope. And and second, I'll just add that um, I think we've been given a, a very unique gift of a glimpse of how things can be different, and 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 that is good and and not so good aspects to it. Uh, but that's you know whether it be how we work, how we interact with friends and family, what we prioritize, and how we act as a society. And, and so forth. And this experience can open our eyes to how we can make things better based on these learnings. So that gives me hope too. And our challenge is to find and, and apply the good in these experiences and not squander that opportunity. Yeah, Kevin, I, I agree with you. There's so many things where I just look at my life over the last, which I can't believe, seven weeks that I'm like, I want to sustain this. Shihara, what gives you hope about the future? I have to say, I agree with Kevin. The thing that makes me most hopeful is that it has brought out good in people. And I'm hopeful that some of that good outlasts the pandemic. But I think the other thing that gives me hope is the experience of other countries that peaked before us makes me hopeful that we will get to the other side of this and that there's light at the end of the tunnel. You know, a few weeks ago, we interviewed you and you shared that the U.S. government has taken this phased approach. Uh, you also shared the major themes of the CARES Act. What have we seen since the release of the act in terms of additional aid? Sure. Um, yeah, when they passed the first bill, they, they called it phase one because they wanted people to know that it was only the first step and that more was going to come. So they did phase one for the health care response. They did phase two, which really focused on individuals. Phase three was the CARES Act, which was all about economic aid. And what we've seen since phase three was enacted is that the government has moved really fast to stand up some of these programs. 
and to pump liquidity into the market as fast as possible. And one of the programs that we had talked about a few weeks ago was the Paycheck Protection Program, which provides smaller businesses and nonprofits with federally guaranteed loans that can be forgiven if they're used for certain purposes. That program was so unbelievably popular that it actually ran out of money in less than two weeks. So last week, Congress passed legislation to provide, to provide additional funding for that program. So we had we now have another bill signed into law as of last Friday, providing another $484 billion of aid. Can you dive a little deeper and just talk about what was included in the bill, maybe some of the specifics? Sure. The engine that was really driving the train again was the Paycheck Protection Program. So the heart of the bill provided $310 billion of additional authorization for the Small Business Loan Program. And so loans are were now being processed again as of 1030 this morning. And of that $310 billion for the Paycheck Protection Program, they walled off about $60 billion specifically for community-based lenders. On top of that, they provided another $60 billion of disaster relief loans and grants for small businesses. They funded another $75 billion for hospitals and healthcare providers, and then $25 billion for COVID-19 testing efforts. So people have been calling this other bill phase 3.5 because it's really an extension of the CARES Act. It's now $2.7 trillion of funding instead of $2.2 trillion. Chair, I'd like to pivot towards, you know, the silver linings, but then also the challenges associated with the relief packages and maybe an internal optimist. I will share a story and then I'd love to get your thoughts once again on kind of the the good and some of the challenges. But I do have a a really good friend who has a brother that owns a chain of pizza parlors up in the Pacific Northwest. Um, Seems like a lot of people are eating pizza nowadays, although it's all takeout. Um, But one of the things that they were able to do as a result of the CARES Act was hire back in excess of 100 employees, uh, folks that they had to lay off, and they essentially just had a skeleton staff before. Uh, But the silver lining is the fact that by bringing them back on, they were able to do a bunch of projects that, quite frankly, were urgent, uh, or excuse me, were important, but not urgent. Things like painting, researching the future menu. Uh, training and all that good stuff. And and now that they had all their employees back, um, they were able to um, have them work on things that really mattered and quite frankly, give them some purpose, you know, to their lives because obviously not working uh, can cause some challenges on their own. Um, And then they were also able to do some philanthropic um, activities as well. And so, you know, I do think that there's some silver linings, but I also know, I mean, you know, there's a lot of challenges that we're hearing about. So I'd love to get your thoughts on if you've heard any, you know, nice stories like that, but then maybe more importantly, what are some of the challenges that organizations and others are having, you know, in this time as it relates to the relief packages? Sure. And I think, Mike, you're, you're exactly right. I think there have been good stories out there. I know that I've certainly seen, even here where I live in Washington, D.C., some of the small businesses that have gotten their money from the Paycheck Protection Program have been able to rehire workers or pay workers. And so there certainly are those success stories. And I think it's, it's clear that a lot of the liquidity is starting to get pumped into the economy. I think about The last I saw it was a little bit more than half of the direct payments from Treasury have now been issued and they've hit people's people's bank accounts or checking accounts. So a lot of the um, the money is flowing now and it is starting to hit the economy. I think it's too soon to say whether it's a complete success or not since a lot of the money hasn't hit the economy yet. And then I think on the challenges, which isn't surprising given that this was a very large bill with new programs that were being set up for the first time, and they were set up very quickly in an effort to get the money out as soon as possible. So there have been some challenges, and particularly with the Paycheck Protection Program, um, the rollout wasn't entirely smooth. I think there was a lot of confusion among businesses about the eligibility rules, how to calculate the forgiveness amounts, Um, There were times when the electronic portal had trouble handling all the volume of applications. So even though people may have been getting approved, they still weren't receiving the money. Um, So there certainly were, I think, hiccups in the process, which isn't a criticism. I think it's just a um, 
fact of a very large new program being stood up, which is multiple times larger than anything that the Small Business Administration's ever administered before. Um, I think some of the other challenges we've seen are that some of the hardest hit industries um, are not getting relief under the bill, either because they're not eligible or some of the restrictions around the programs don't work for them. So those are exactly the types of things that lawmakers are looking at to fill in gaps when they do the next wave of legislation in phase, in phase four. John, let's pivot to tax. And I would love for you to provide kind of a, a deeper level perspective on some potential tax policy changes that we may see and what are some of the potential impacts. So I think we've seen the biggest tax changes we're going to see, especially on the business side, in a phase three bill that passed at the end of March. I think in a phase four bill, there could be some tax items, but I think they will play a more supporting role rather than being a primary focus. I do expect on the individual side, Congress is likely to pass some additional direct payments to individuals. Um, I think they'll clean up some of the tax pieces from phase three where there's some questions or confusions about interactions of various pieces. Uh, one business tax piece I am relatively bullish on is a uh, reprise of a provision we saw enacted in the financial crisis in the uh, 2009 period. when. Normally, when debt is canceled, the, uh, the, the borrower whose debt is forgiven owes income tax on the amount of the forgiven debt. And I expect Congress to pass a, a rule mimicking what was happening in 2009 that defers the income tax treatment of forgiven debt. And then I do expect it to be a long line of other ideas people put forward, um, some of which will be more responsive to the crisis at hand, and others will be candidly a bit opportunistic, um, an attempt to sort of sneak something past the goalie when the fences are down. Um, I, as I said, I think that we're going to see a relatively light tax title in phase four, although it's entirely possible we see something more robust rather than less robust when this is all said and done. John, what about some of the old tax deductions that we used to get? Is there any possibility they'll change some of those? Some of so those we, rules? Yeah, we did see Speaker Pelosi put forward the idea of undoing the salt cap as part of a phase four bill. There's some people who are in high tax states who are chafing at the impact of that cap on their tax treatment. Having said that, they don't necessarily make the most sympathetic plaintiffs in terms of people most directly affected by the hardship imposed by the public health and economic crisis of the coronavirus pandemic. And it's not clear to me that adjusting the salt cap is really responsive directly to coronavirus. To me, it, it, it may look more opportunistic. I, I sort of find it hard to imagine that proposal getting enacted. But again, especially with something coming from the speaker or the president, you would never discount out of hand an idea put forward by somebody in that position of leadership. Great. Thank you, John. Kevin, let's go to you. As we look ahead to phase four and beyond, what are we seeing policymakers deliberate on? Sure. Uh, so given that phase uh, 3.5 was just passed into law a few days ago, uh, deliberation is intensifying on phase four, but it remains to be seen what, what ultimately might be included. Uh, with that said, it's reasonable to assume phase four could include uh, extensions, enhancements, or fixes to some of the mitigation provisions in the phase three CARES Act. Uh, and that could include some technical corrections based on observations about how those provisions have been operating to date. Uh, areas being considered uh, include paid leave, uh, hazard pay for healthcare workers, uh, food stamps, more direct payments to individuals, and health insurance for unemployed workers. Uh, it could also include some uh, newly developed relief provisions aimed at businesses or, or certain industries uh, and fiscal relief uh, for cities and states, although the, the state and local funding uh, appears to be under greater debate. Now, beyond that, uh, U.S. infrastructure investment is a critical part of the conversation as well. And that could be an important source of job growth during the recovery while we in invest in, uh, in our nation's future. Um, whether infrastructure spending is tackled in phase four or is deliberated for a possible phase five or even a phase six in the coming weeks uh, also uh, remains to be seen uh, as to how this will play out. Um, I'll add that, that infrastructure is a broad term here, uh, including what comes to mind for most people, such as 
roads, bridges, airports, ports, transit systems, water and waste treatment systems, uh, the electric grid, and so forth. And each of those areas has, uh, of course, a prioritized set of investment opportunities uh, that can be used to position the U.S. for a, a more competitive future and, and to create jobs. Um, with that said, I, uh, we've all experienced and observed uh, over the last few weeks that some of our most critical and immediate infrastructure needs are in the areas of telehealth, telework, telelearning, and broadband connectivity that underpins all of those. That's been um, uh, an incredibly important part of our infrastructure uh, to enable uh, people to social distance and for us to continue uh, uh, such as we can uh, given the circumstances. Uh, some funding was included for these areas uh, in the CARES Act, uh, but we see the need for more short-term expenditures while we're navigating through the pandemic, uh, and also as fundamental investment to create more impactful structural change in the longer term while creating jobs in the process. Uh, so perhaps lawmakers will consider both of these needs during their deliberations. So Kevin, um, can you talk about some of the additional short-term funding priorities and longer-term infrastructure needs that you see in these areas? Sure. So short-term funding can be focused on at least three areas. Uh, the first is for implementation of rapidly deployable or temporary broadband connectivity solutions to areas that lack access to broadband, uh, typically rural communities, such that those populations have the possibility of using the telehealth, telework, or, or telelearning solutions I previously mentioned. Uh, the second uh, is to more aggressively support telehealth solutions that could immediately aid our healthcare system in dealing with the pandemic. Uh, for example, uh, solutions that enable people to communicate with their caregiver remotely or be remotely monitored uh, can not only increase both efficiency and, and, and e efficacy of the treatment, uh, but reduce the potential for additional infections or overloading of the hospitals and, or, or clinics by reducing or eliminating uh, in-person interactions. And third uh, is to address the reality that while schools have moved to remote learning, this doesn't work for children from low-income households that can't afford broadband. Uh, we need these children to have options for safely continuing their education uh, with solutions such as community Wi-Fi or, or funding assistance to get uh, broadband into the household. Uh, now, that, that covers short term. For the longer term, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on the three here. So telehealth. Um, first of all, with the, with the growth of IoT, wearables, uh, and so forth, telehealth has been providing a, a wide range of services to patients, uh, from emergency medicine to remote monitoring, counseling services, and, and access to providers. Uh, but there are challenges here uh, in the regulatory landscape, uh, insurance coverage, and further development of the solutions themselves that need to be addressed uh, to enable uh, widespread adoption and, and realization of this. So regulatory factors are protections uh, for privacy and security, handling of licenses and credentials, handling of controlled substances, uh, management of coverages and payments, uh, just to name a few. Um, insurance coverage factors include the type of telehealth services covered and the extent to which they're covered, uh, particularly uh, through Medicare. Uh, and uh, there are solution enhancement needs uh, in the tele telehealth solutions themselves, including uh, the extendability of those, how they're integrated in, in with other solutions, and certification of platforms uh, to increase the scale and scope of the of the solutions that are offered. Uh, and there are um, government uh, statute, regulatory, and policy challenges uh, to address the uh, need to support continued innovation and widespread adoption of telehealth. Um, telelearning is in a little bit different situation. Uh, we have a skilled workforce uh, that's uh, increasingly going to be a critical national advantage, whether it be for healthcare practitioners uh, or trade workers or technology developers. And the demand will be such that those skills can't be sourced from uh, all sourced from urban areas or, or uh, large universities. Um, so we should be treating telelearning as a national priority as well to close the workforce skill gaps that we know are coming and ensure that the organizations uh, will have the talent uh, to be able to find it. Um, that requires uh, a broad spectrum of, of curriculum that can be accessed and learned anywhere across the country. Um, and the, the idea there is that uh, basically every available brain and skilled set of hands uh, that they're willing to work in tomorrow's economy are able to work in, in tomorrow's economy. Um, so telelearning has a great potential uh, to create equity of access as well for higher education. Um, and um, 
uh, we've got the opportunity here to uh, increase that access, make it more affordable. Otherwise, we become less skilled and, and less competitive as a nation. So uh, great opportunities with telelearning. The pandemic has reinforced how critical it is for us to take a fresh look at, at solving this issue sooner rather than later. So to do that, we need better data on where the broadband access limitations exist. We need a willingness to entertain a growing portfolio of technology solutions to close the gap. Um, a favorable regulatory climate to encourage continued innovation, private investment, and I'll uh, argue public-private partnerships or federal funding support to close the investment gaps. And Kevin, quick question. Um, telehealth and telelearning have been around for quite some time. Um, is there just pent-up uh, innovation that's already been there, or do you actually see the need for, and you've outlined quite a number of things that could potentially be done and are going to be done, is there also just this opportunity to innovate as a result of the fact that we've now seen, you know, potentially the promise, if you will, of telehealth and telelearning, and we could take it to the next level? Uh, it's it's uh, it's certainly all of the above, quite frankly, that, that uh, there are um, – uh, regulatory factors uh, uh, to handle things such as privacy and security. I think I would previously mentioned those, but there, there, there as well is opportunity to establish uh, 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 platforms that have uh, improved integration capabilities uh, with uh, with solutions that are that are already out in the marketplace today, um, and increase the the reach of those. Um, and there's some necessary certification around these these platforms as well, in particular in the provision of, of, of medical services, for example. But that that generally speaking applies to both telehealth and, and telelearning. There, there's been a great deal of innovation. There's there's potential for more innovation, uh, but at the end of the day, um, uh, we, we need focused in investment and a and a. Um, a conducive uh, regulatory climate uh, to be able to enable widespread uh, adoption and, and use of these uh, capabilities for the country. It's fascinating to think when you talk about infrastructure, most people probably wouldn't think of telehealth or telelearning. It's probably not the first thing, but it seems like as my wife is a teacher sitting in the other room doing her Zoom with her classes, this whole notion of how do we make more investments uh, in telelearning specifically, but then you know, I serve healthcare clients and the uh, that I see like 75% of all physicians are using telehealth. I think I saw a stat last week. I'm not sure if that's right or not. Uh, but it seems like those would be two ripe areas, as you indicated, for potential investment in the future. What should businesses be thinking about today? And what do you think some of the biggest risks in this new environment are? Um, and, and John, maybe let's start with you. I think businesses need to be aware that there's going to be a tremendous amount of scrutiny from uh, the executive branch, from Congress, from the press, about who took money from the various coronavirus response programs and what they did with it. So did you uh, hire, uh, rehire your people? Did you keep them on staff? Or did you make acquisitions? Did you um, give bonuses to your executives, et cetera? And I think there'll be scrutiny for a number of years going forward as the public uh, remains interested in uh, how the money was used and who got it. And, and John, what would you uh, recommend to those companies? Because it's interesting. It's not only just funding from the CARES Act, but it's uh, funding potentially from your insurance carriers um, and even FEMA. Um, what, what guidance do you give clients that are kind of at the front end of this? Um, and when you say they need to be able to substantiate it on the back end, uh, what guidance are you giving them? Well, I would suggest companies be very careful about um, furloughs and layoffs. I'd be careful about bonuses for executives and um, owners of businesses, um, expansion plans, um, acquisitions, um, and it's just the um, general uh, narrative around you know how money gets used. I think will be really subject to great investigation and and, and potentially years of inquiries from various uh, federal uh, and, 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 and media sources. Kevin, how about you? Um, what, what do you think businesses should be thinking about today and what are some of the risks that you see? I'll just add that the, the scrutiny will not only be on how the money was spent, but what was accomplished for the nation and by when. So think of uh, outcomes and timing. Uh, as we've seen during this pandemic, timing of delivery can be just as critical as what was delivered. 
Uh, so, uh, if uh, for a uh, for an organization uh, taking the funding, be prepared to account uh, for uh, the timing considerations around this and the execution challenges that may arise, whether that be with supply chains, access to skilled resources, uh, or local approvals or permitting uh, for whatever delivery commitments they're making, as as we uh, uh, establish and uh, continue to operate in in uh, in our new normal. Chair, what do you think? businesses should be thinking about what are some of the biggest risks in the, the new environment? So I, I agree with John. The biggest risk is that whenever you take um, taxpayer money, even if it's repaid, there is going to be scrutiny moving forward. So if you take that money and later lay off workers or offshore job or anything like that, it will be, I think, scrutinized. And I think we saw that certainly in 2008 with people who took TARP, even though they repaid it, there was still a lot of scrutiny. Um, but just to have a different answer, I think, than John and Kevin, I, w- I would say maybe the other big risk out there is just repaying all of this in the future. Um, that would be a, um, you know, I, I think the risk as well. We've already, we're at $3 trillion right now, the economic aid at phase 3.5. And I think as Kevin said, we may have a phase four, five, and six. So the deficit is just going to mount and mount and mount. And at some point that is going to have to be repaid. And I think that the other risk for businesses is what measures are put in place when um, the government gets serious about repaying the debt. So I would say that might be another risk to think about. What is the first thing that organizations should do to really understand how phases, I guess, three and four, and maybe you'll throw 3.5 in there, can help them? But what should they do to get up to speed and really understand uh, what it can do to help them over the next several months? Uh, Shira, I'd like to start with you. I think to get educated about the different options of benefits in the bills, how they interact with each other, since taking some relief will prohibit you from taking other relief, and then um, keeping in mind the risks that John and I talked about earlier. Perfect. John, what's your thoughts? I I agree. There's a really wide, rich uh, array of possible programs and benefits, whether they're in the tax code or lending or grant programs, and um, I think it's it would be silly to look at one of them in isolation. I think it's important to look at the entire range of things out there, talk to trusted advisors and counsel, and make informed decisions going forward. Great. And Kevin? I'll just add that it's, it, this, is, uh, this is expansive legislation and obviously an unprecedented amount of funding, and it can impact or help each organization differently. So start with a summary of the, of the four pieces of legislation that have been uh, – uh, been acted to date, uh, identify what may, what may be relevant to your organization, then go deeper on those particular topics of interest. Uh, and we offer a great deal of information to help on this, as do others, and, and can certainly help uh, if needed. I was going to say Deloitte.com, go to our COVID page. <laughs> Final question, and um, this one kind of hits home a bit because I was walking in our town in Northern California yesterday. I think probably people are walking like 10 times more than they used to, and uh, we we're in our downtown and we saw uh, a friend of ours sitting outside of their restaurant where they're doing takeout like many are. Um, and we asked her, you know, how's it going? She had mentioned that they're having challenges uh, getting funds from the Paycheck Protection Program. And so the question I have for each of you is what advice would you give to businesses that truly do have the greatest need? And oftentimes these are small businesses, whether they're small retailers, um, and a lot has been talked about restaurants, but what advice would you give to them? Um, and let's start with uh, John. So I'll give two pieces of advice here. One is understand there are no cookie cutter solutions. What works for the restaurant next to you may not work for your dry cleaning business and vice versa. And so um, really understand what your options are and, and study them carefully. And second, you know, everybody has a member of Congress or a member of the Senate who is, has a staff dedicated to doing assistance with people having trouble navigating federal bureaucracy. Uh, that is, I, I, all of us who have worked in Capitol Hill have done some of that casework kind of assistance. It is hard work, but finding a, a somebody who can sort of give a little bit of oomph to your voice and help them uh, help you get your uh, case heard by people who need to understand why your application is being held up or to make sure that it is um, uh, moving through the system properly could be a tremendous uh, benefit. I would not be afraid to look up my local member of Congress or my senator and ask for some, some help here. That's fantastic. Kevin, how about you? 
I'd say if the need is for funding, submit your application or request as soon as possible, uh, as the funding is not unlimited, uh, and you'll buy yourself as much time as possible for the for the processing uh, that will be taking place. Uh, in particular, if 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 uh, uh, as some of these uh, may get backlogged or have been backlogged, uh, and and um, using that time to get the funding into your hands. Awesome, Shahira, take us home. Yeah, I think there's a lot of resources at the local level to help small businesses who may not have, you know, a lot of lawyers advising them, but certainly local chambers of commerce are good options. There's local business development um, organizations that they can go to, but to certainly look to the local organizations to help navigate some of these more complicated programs. Awesome. Thank you, Shahira, Kevin, and John. Um, This has been fantastic. I learned something new every time. So uh, thank you for your time. Uh, This is obviously unbelievably important to large organizations, small businesses, and, and quite frankly, the citizens of the U.S. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin, Shahira, and John for providing an update on phase 3.5 of the CARES Act and insights on what phase four might contain in the future. I will say we are recording these in a variety of places virtually all across the country. And this was probably the most challenging with my Wi-Fi and some of the audio, but my guess is by the time we package it all up, it will sound great. As I've mentioned before, a short podcast can only do so much to break down the insights. We hope that you have a chance to visit our COVID-19 Resource Center for timely updates insights and guides to help you act today. You can just visit Deloitte.com to find them all. If you have any stories that you want to hear more about, suggest them at Deloitte.com on our Resilient page. And for all of our Resilient episodes, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, and even Spotify. Until next time, stay safe and remain resilient.